Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined once again today by retired Master Sergeant John Keane of the Morphe Auction Company. You're the NFA specialist here. Yes, I am. So you deal with all the machine guns, and you have a pretty extensive background in collecting and dealing and being I, around all manner of I've been guns. very fortunate that I was mentored by some of the first generation of the machine gun collectors, enthusiasts. Uh, you know, the great names, you know, Dolph Goldsmith and others that we really know. And, uh, and, and I've been very fortunate that they mentored me along and got me interested. So the question that I have for you today, or the subject that I want to talk about, is the difference between original and not entirely original machine guns, specifically as it applies to the U.S. military, uh, or U.S. military guns. So just like as, a, as, an, as an example to start off, rising submachine guns. They're all like they're all original. There's no such thing as, you know, someone put together a parts kit on some new manufactured receiver to make a rising. Almost none. The risings were were manufactured by Harrington and Richardson, and they were brought in and they were sold to the military, and then they were also made and sold to civilian sector, you know, police right. and other like that. And if there is a one that is not original. Uh, I did see one once, hmm. which um, somebody wanted a Model 55 paratrooper uh, rising. And they made it out of a 50. And they made it out of a 50. Okay. Okay. And they okay. filled their spot and their need for a, a paratrooper Model 55. But it was still an original fact produced rising. Right. Um, and when it comes down to it, they were, it, and you talk about original. There's original in fact, and then there's original as a legal term, too. Right. There's original in fact, which means it was produced in the 1940s. It was registered either then or at the factory or registered during an amnesty period. And then there's the ones that we took into our service, took out and used in the Pacific Theater and other places, and they didn't come back when, for whatever reason. They got dropped. They got captured. They thrown just, into the Lunga whatever River. it was, <laughs> and then uh, lo and behold, it's now after 1968, and uh, somebody says, "Hey, there's a desire for right. Let's import them," and some got imported, and then they became pre-86 dealer sample risings. Are they original guns? Yeah, they're unquestionably original guns, but they're not in that same legal status nope. that, they, that that makes so. Uh, Next gun. So I'm going to skip forward a bit to Browning 1917A1, which we made more than 50,000 of them during World War II. And yet, as far as I can tell, it's really hard to find an actual original one. Yes, because that particular gun in the model, there were, there were lots of them during World War II, but they remained in service. And let's face it, you can't just stick one in your duffel bag and not have it's, it noticed. It's not a super easy souvenir. Yeah. Right? It's not a super easy souvenir. It's heavy. It's bulky. Um, some did come back. Some did get registered during the amnesty. But there were so many more that were made as parts kits onto side plates and registered right. side plates. The, the recreational shooting industry drove that tremendously. When we were talking in another video about how inexpensive ammunition used to be, and the parts for the 17 A1s and the 1919 A4s. I was going to ask you how the 1919 very very much similar. parallel to each other. Okay. Okay. Very few, relatively very few original CNR 1919 A4s and particularly 1919 A6s are out there in the collecting community because there were so many registered side plates made and put on kits that were brought in, uh, the 28 Colt commercial guns. So many kits came in from South America and then put on registered U.S. side plates uh, and taken out into the recreational industry. So part of this is that very few of these guns, uh, where the Risings were sold to the military and to the public, essentially, and to police departments, there weren't a lot of police departments buying belt-fed Brownings. No. Some, but not very The many. original belt-fed Brownings you find usually come out of the prison systems. 
that they were up on the walls of Sing Sing Prison and other places like that. Okay. Um, and that's where you'll see the Westinghouse, you know, Brownings come in from generally. Um, okay. You'll also see some Remingtons, and those are always really neat when you can see the Remington Brownings uh, come yeah. in. And I guess there's also an element of, you know, we again, we talked in a previous video about MG08 Maxims and how there's so many of them here, and they're originals. They're German guns through and through because they were brought in from abroad. There was a time when we like, were considering as a country adopting the Maxim machine gun <laughs> as a U.S. standard. But American industry said, oh, no, we want to have an American design. And of course, that means American money right. to, for us to build them. But what we never brought in as significant numbers of war souvenirs were our own guns. No. So we've got Nambus, like that guy, yeah. which I don't know if that's in frame. But we got a ton of Japanese Nambu machine guns, but we don't have the 1917 A1s that the Marines were using at the same time in the same place because it's legal for them to bring home a Japanese gun. Gun. Souvenir, but if but they bring home that 1917, that's big time theft. They were supposed to. They trouble. were supposed to. They were supposed to turn that stuff in. Same reason, and, and you know, if you were if you were a soldier in Vietnam, there was a, there was an army edict. You can't bring home a 1911 or 1911 A1 pistol, even if you had one that you personally owned from World War One days, because soldiers could bring back those guns from World War One and right. keep them. All right. If you had one and you were World War One and World War Two, and now being and, and the, one of those very few relatively that got into Vietnam, or your father was World War One, World War Two, and now you're in Vietnam, and many were, many, many, many were, and Dad said, "Bring that 1911 with you. I had it in World War One or World War Two, and use it; it'll defend you." And you do. You aren't going to get it back into the U.S. I didn't realize that. Even if it's your own documented property going in, no guns that were. No guns, unless they are marked with either a C prefix or an NM prefix, were allowed to be brought back officially hmm. from Vietnam because they didn't want widespread theft of right. government property. And they knew that there were no C or an N prefix guns that would be. Right. So if you had a commercial or a cult national match, yeah, that's okay. So what we end up with is this interesting situation where the commonality of a gun does not, you can't interpolate from how common it was to how many of them are actually going to be on the registry today. Now, I, these two examples that I brought up are ones that I already pretty much know the answers to. One I don't know is the BAR. I will get to the BAR, but I'm going to insert something outside the scope of this interview for a moment. Okay. And think about this. Why are the Bren guns, original Bren guns, so scarce and so highly sought after in this NFA uh, collecting community. I mean, um, my guess would be that they were allied weapons, and so we weren't really allowed to be bringing those home either. Yeah, we didn't romp through and, and loot Great Britain of their guns. But but but, the, but the, even more the British important, might say we did romp through and do a fair amount of looting, but we didn't. Come we home we with did the romp through Britain and have a lot of good times <laughs> there, right? But um, but we will say this: the Bren remained in service throughout the entire period yes. of time yes. where it could have been brought into this country and registered for private ownership. That's right. Because before 68, you could bring in a foreign gun and just register it. Yeah, like you're, during an amnesty Like period. you're making a, a short-barreled rifle today. Essentially, yes. But, but by the time that the British were no longer keeping the Brennan service, right. the opportunity for them to be registered for private ownership, that ship had sailed. Which... I, we're starting to wander a little bit again, but that explains the Mat 49s as well. Why they're the only Mat 49s essentially in the U.S. are vet bringbacks from early in Vietnam, right. because they were in service with the French during the whole period that they could be amnestied, and we were never in a war alongside the French before '68. Right after to, to be able to bag uh, the guns right. as souvenirs, there was never an opportunity for them to come in. We so. could talk about the Swedish K's too, yeah. if you wanted to think. Back to the BAR, because that's a gun that could go either way, and I'm really not sure. How readily available are original BARs? I have been in this collecting hobby for a while, and the BAR is pretty common, in my okay. opinion. And I've talked to people who are now deceased, and I'll, I can say a name, Richard Ray, very, very high-profile collector. He said to me, he said, I have seen so many VARs in so many police departments. He made a he made a 
uh, what, he didn't make a living doing it because he didn't need to make a living doing it, but he certainly had a lot of fun going to the police departments and getting the BARs out of the police departments and then selling them off to the public. And it did the, the police departments a lot of good. It did the NFA collecting community a lot of good. And there is, you, we get a lot of money for the VARs because the VARs are such great fun to shoot and they're such great historical collector's items that the demand of the VARs is very high, even though there's quite a few out there, actually, relatively speaking. Uh, so original VARs versus non-original, there was enough of a demand for the VARs that the, the, the group industry made receivers and assembled guns onto them. There's enough of a demand for BARs that the Ohio Ordnance Works is making semi-automatic ones and they're really good and okay. they're really well made. So was it primarily police departments were the main mechanism for BARs getting into civilian hands? More so there than I think any other method, yeah, a significant okay. number did come back after World War One and World War Two, but not in really great numbers. But for a while, the BAR with quite so, a few police departments. Was that, I don't know if you have insight into this, but was that a, fact, a function of police departments in, say, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s are buying BARs direct from Colt? Or is that after World War II, we have so many of them, and maybe after World War I, well, that the army is providing them to the police as... They became surplus right. as we divested ourselves from them, uh, from the U.S. military, they became surplus as we brought other things in. And when the police department needed something, they went to the the government say, hey, we, we need these. Okay. Um, so that can that police use can account for like 1918A2 World War II military guns yeah. go and, from and, the army to and, police and, and then the police and there can were resell plenty them. Of, and, there were, um, and there were guns that were in armories, National Guard armories and other places after World War I, before World War II, that got out into the civilian public, maybe not officially, but then they got registered during the amnesty period, and you'll see those out there. And then Colt was making and selling to anybody who had the money Colt commercial. That's true. BARs. Right. And so you see Colt commercial, and we have one in the upcoming auction. Okay. Um, and then there's guns that were made right at the same time as the military guns were for World War One. at the very end of World War One, of course. And they got built for the military, but never got accepted into the military. So they're... Hmm. They're Colt guns, but they're not military-proofed guns. So there's, okay. as, there are many of these. There's some wonderful collecting opportunities for the different variations of the BARs, and some of them are very rare and very highly sought after. But there's a couple of collections out there where somebody's got pretty much all the variants. That would be impressive. And that is impressive. And I've been in one, one or two of the collections like that, and it's great to be able to see them. Like on here, you see a rack of them. So let's take a look at the difference in this one, and the difference in that one. One of the interesting things that, that I noticed when I started visiting gun collections in Europe is that it was way easier for the European collectors to have M16A1s than American collectors. Because we lost a lot of those guns in Vietnam, and a lot of them went back into the European market where everything's much more highly regulated and restricted, but the people who do have the licenses can just, can get buy, them, can just buy them. an ex-Vietnam M16A1. And like all of the significant machine gun, including collections that I would visit, they'd all have one or two, like, oh, that's my M16A1. They weren't and, a big deal. Right. And here in the U.S., they are a big deal because... There wasn't, this is again, one of those things where there was very little opportunity for an M16A1 to become a transferable civilian-owned gun. I'm going to take a different position on that. Okay. Years ago, there wasn't a really significant historical interest well, in an M16 true. or an M16A1. That's true. You know, I'm sure I could say the name of a couple people out there who really capitalized on that and bought these early and rare variants of the M16 back before there were any real interest in them. And they didn't pay a lot of money for them. But now they are huge because there are some very well-heeled, very discerning, and very passionate collectors of early Armalite Fairchild and other, you know, uh, Harrington and Richardson and Hydromatics by General Motors. And, and there are very, very small numbers relative to the collector interest of those guns. But I will say to you, 
M16s in the 9 million serial range. Plenty of them out there. M16A1, okay. plenty of them out there. They what were being built for what? the civilian market and sold to the civilian market in, through the 1986. Oh, um, that's true. I didn't think about that. I'm thinking U.S. military provenance ones, but that's right. Colt could continue to sell them because they were being made. And they were, and, and they were made okay. on the same lines, and they were right. same as the contract guns. And so I, I look at it, and somebody says, hey, John, I've got an M16A1 I want to sell you, or an M16. And I'll say, well, what's the, what's the serial number start with? If it's a 9, I know what it is. If they say it's a 5 or a 4, I get really interested really quickly. Right, those are the ones that... <laughs> you know, because I'm like, ooh, that's going to be really good. I assume the military ones, uh, the like actual military-issued ones that are now in civilian hands... Scarce. Is, is that basically guns that were yoinked, like, pocketed by guys in the army and then registered in 68? There's some real interesting things in there, and that may be another, another video we do about what's weird in the registry. What about an M16 that is clearly an Air Force or an early army contract gun that's had its serial number <laughs> scalloped out? I remembered this. And then example. there's then right there next to it is SP1, blah, 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 blah. And I got that gun on consignment, thinking it was a converted. I never saw the gun. It was an estate piece. And it came in, and I got it on consignment. I'm like, oh, look at that. It's an SP1 that's been converted. And it comes in, and I look at it, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> it's a stolen army it's gun. It's a stolen with a army gun with gone. someone put a serial number on it. And then I, oh, there's the original amnesty registration form showing it being exactly what I'm looking at. And that form with that gun makes that gun. Badges. Legit and also legal. And legal, because it was an amnesty registered gun, and it's amnesty is an amnesty. And that was a neat thing. Um, that was cool. But, uh, but the, yeah, the ones that are military, U.S. military contract guns are ones that were brought back by veterans clandestinely registered during the amnesty period, um, and some that were brought back and didn't make the amnesty period, but were able to be remanufactured by licensed manufacturers. And I, I remember I had a couple in here in the past where they were remanufactured uh, guns, really, really well done, made guns. Um, and then there's guns that were that are all these combination of things. Okay, it's this, and they took and they put original early, you know, round, round buttstock you know, butt pads on them or, and there's no end to the variations yeah. that we see there. All right. Any other particular models that I'm leaving out that I ought to ask you about? Well, I think we've covered, like Thompson's are pretty easy for Thompson's the same pretty, reason as yeah, Thompson's they, are, they went to police. They were commercial. There's then, lots, there's lots yeah. and lots of Thompson's out there, but, and find, but finding a nice original military one is kind of a special, special thing. Um, other military, U.S. military guns out there. I think we've done a pretty good job of, of okay. covering them. Uh, you might want to mention the M60 machine gun. Um, there it seems are, like one that would be very hard to have on the registry transferable. But there are those that were made and got into the military's hands and then got brought back. So finding a, finding a Vietnam-era M60 is pretty special stuff. Um, and... But then there are the ones that were made later. There are ones that were made by cutting off the front and the back and the trunk. It was supposed to be rebuilt, and they got into lunch boxes, brought home, and then got into man licensed manufacturers who remanufactured them to spec, put the parts on them, and register them. And you'll see those, you know, Taylor Manufacturing or something like that. And they're M60s. Um, but finding a finding a Vietnam era M60 is pretty pretty special stuff when you can get one of those. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you for the insight. It's fun. It's hopefully. nice. Thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. A little bit of interesting question about what, you know, it's always interesting to look at the machine guns that are available and think about how did that gun go from whatever factory it came out of to now being in civilian hands? It, There's I'm, so many different yeah, my stories. Yeah, my <laughs> end statement regarding that and regarding a lot of these guns that are here is human ingenuity has no bounds. <laughs> the ability, and I... 
soldiers that I was in the combat area with, they can try to get stuff back. Interesting how he did it. And other soldiers who I talked to, how did you get that? Thing? Oh, that fits great inside a spare tire of a Jeep. <laughs> you know, Mazda Jeep got right through, or no, that one went perfectly in the inside the body of a truck, and then they built big X-ray machines, never even, you know, detected it or something like that. Um, so you're going to give away everyone's and, secrets now. Well, <laughs> I chickened out. I wasn't about to bring anything back from the combat. I had a career I didn't want to lose, and I'm like, no. Later, I found out I probably could have brought back a lot of stuff if I'd only had the courage to to, to risk my career on it. I wasn't willing to do that. All right. Next video we do, we'll consider doing uh, John's Funky War Stories. But sure. uh, thank you for joining me. Hopefully you guys enjoy the video. Thanks for watching. A pleasure. Thank you.